Nice right. to see your face, even though it's, I only saw you yesterday in the College of Dentistry, so it's nice to see you again. Um, I'll give you an introduction. So this is Professor Ziad Al-Ani. Dr. Al-Ani was awarded his MSc in Prosthodontics from Manchester University in 1999. In 2004, he was awarded his doctorate from the same university. The title of his thesis was Studies in Temporomandibular Disorders and Occlusion. He was appointed by Manchester University as a clinical teacher in restorative dentistry in 2004, as well as a research coordinator for the TMD clinic and is recently a senior lecturer at Glasgow Dental Hospital and School. In 2006, he obtained MFDS from the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. In, recogni in recognition of his teaching activities, he was awarded the status of Fellow of Higher Education Academy in 2010. Dr. Al Ani was one of the two finalists in the Teacher of the Year 2006, as awarded by the Dental Defence Union. The award recognised excellence in dental education. He was again a nominee for the 2007 and 2008 Dentist Teacher of the Year Award by the Dental Defence Union after nominations made by undergraduate students at Manchester Dental School. He has published numerous articles on occlusion and TMD in peer-reviewed scientific papers, and he is the author of the book, Temporomandibular Dis Disorders, A Problem-Based Approach and the book, Practical Procedures in Dental Occlusion. Today's lecture is on occlusal considerations in anterior restorations. Thank you, Professor Ziad. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thanks for inviting me to speak at this uh, meeting. Um, I'm, I'm well known by my interactive lectures, uh, actually, and I want always my, uh, the audience to be engaged in the lecture, and I have reasons for that. I'll show, you, show that in a minute. Can I ask all the participants if uh, you please can uh, go on this website, uh, polf.com forward slash ziadalani745. I want you to vote for a couple of questions or maybe more, uh, just to, uh, as an ice breaking first. And the other thing is some of the like seeking opinions about what you're doing at the moment in practice. So please go everybody to this and uh, using your smartphone polf.com forward slash 745 and you should see uh, the following one you should see something like this one okay right and just put your actual name please don't put any funny names because i might expose the names trust me uh, i'm joking this is anonymous all right so uh, please just uh, put your actual name in case of like uh, if you want you to see your scores or a proof of your attendance as well, that would be good. So we can actually prove that you attend in the lectures for your CPD uh, or other things. So I just want to make sure that everybody went to this polf.com forward slash the other 745 and you already registered your name to be able to vote in this lecture. Okay. Just so to help everyone, I've just popped it into the chat as well so they can copy Excellent. and paste it. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's really useful. Thank you. Okay, so yes, copy and paste if you want in your browser. Just put it in normal browser, you should see this. I just uh, had some screenshots of what you may see in your smartphone. Okay. Right, so let's start. Oh, well, uh, already people started. I want you, first of all, just to uh, you know, put a vote here in which category best describes you here. So we, some people start already voting, well done. Okay, getting more. Yeah, I can see more GDPs and dental practitioners, one specialist, very good. Okay. Yeah, people are just voting as they register now. I know that that's really good. So the system works very well. And I'll show you the reason why we need, I like actually to use this in a lecture like occlusion. You know, occlusion is a dry topic. Uh, people find it sometimes hard to understand or hard uh, to listen to sometimes. It's uh, uh, really, really good to make it interactive. So people are voting already, so that's fine. I know uh, the link is here, guys, still here, and it is in the chat box, uh, posted uh, kindly by Andrew. Okay, I can see a few people voting. So most of them, the GDPs uh, and two specialists are getting more voting now. So let's move on. And this is the reason 
for why I like my Zoom lectures to be interactive. Because traditional lectures on Zoom, not terribly impressive anymore. I don't want anybody like this or you know, nodding off in my lecture. So that's the reason for making it interactive. I believe in this, tell me I forget, show me I remember, involve me I understand. And I like to put uh, the chocolate on the top of the broccoli to make it uh, delicious and to benefit from what's been underneath here. So putting some something, some spices, some flavors on the top of occlusion topic will make it easy to digest. So we know occlusion, the word occlusion is by the way, the easiest definition uh, in dentistry if you want, and it's the most difficult to understand and uh, everybody believes in that. But because our lecture is about, you know, aesthetics, I tried actually to get some tips related to occlusion in anterior teeth. Because when we say occlusion, people always think about the bite, about posterior teeth. But how about the anterior teeth? So look at that. The best restorative and periodontal care will fail with a bad occlusion. And if you don't get into, uh, if you, sorry, if you do get into trouble and understanding the occlusion will generally get you out of it. If you don't understand the occlusion, you won't find the, uh, an answer for some of the clinical problems. You don't have predictable results in, in terms of restorative dentistry. So again, don't overlook this very crucial part of examination, which is examining the occlusion. And the occlusion can be a soul destroying experience. And I know many of my colleagues who had years in practice, they had, or they met patients who actually fed up with, you know, patching up their restorations and keep fracturing again. But the question should be asked here, is the problem in the materials, in the dental materials here, or is something else? There's something else could be the occlusion as one important factor of causing this catastrophic fail. And you have to remember that occlusion is more than adjusting high occlusal contacts, is more than detecting it with the articulating paper and adjusting it. This is not occlusion. So we need to now think beyond this. We need to go now the extra mile of examining the occlusion to, to know what could be the factors of causing this fail. So let me put this uh, like a slide in front of you on the screen. And, uh, you know, I just, want you to think about what could be the cause of this drifting of upper incisors of this patient, chipped and worn anterior teeth of the other patient, repeated fracturing of class four incisor restorations, composite restorations, for example, uh, like previous veneers keep breaking and chipping off, all of this related to, again, anterior teeth and anterior restorations. What could be the reason when, let's vote for that, when occlusal trauma is not evident, I put that because I know that people, and you can type in now, guys, I, I know that some people will say now occlusal trauma. I'm sure that will happen. So occlusal trauma, this is a wide term, but what we mean by occlusal trauma? Is it a high restoration? Is a high, like a, a restoration not done in a proper occlusion because it's actually raising the bite or what? what is the main reason? So let's see what, the participants think about that. So just put a couple of words here. What could be the reason for these clinical problems? Let's see if there are any answers. Okay. No responses yet. So people are shy to vote. Just write anything you think is the reason for failure of this. Don't worry, I'm not going to show names, guys. Names are not going to be shown here. It's anonymous. I promise. Okay. So no voting yet. Come on, guys. Any votes here? Bruxism. Oh, well done. The first vote here. First brave one. Parafunction, you mean here. Okay. Erosion. Okay. That could be the reason from palatal erosion here, but you can see fracture of the restorations. Uh, chipping of, of like uh, a veneer 
okay, I don't think erosion is the reason here. Parafunction and bruxism, yes, that could be the reason for that, yeah. Other than that, if say that the patient, we examine the patient, the patient's not aware of uh, bruxism, but you know that only 20% of patients, they can tell that they clench and grind uh, uh, their teeth. And we usually know by the partner who couldn't sleep because of uh, you know uh, the noise of clenching and grinding. But again, we have other uh, methods of detecting you know the uh, signs of active bruxism in soft tissues. But say that you know we couldn't find any like evidence of a parafunction or bruxism. What could be other reasons? But this is very very sensible answer. Okay, let's see. You know, guys, there is something called the envelope of movement. So the jaw has like some sort of you know uh, different points between centric relation, which is the uh, jaw relationship, the centric occlusion or ICP intercuspid position which is the heat, this is the teeth relationship. And we can uh, push the jaw forward, we can open maximally. So the jaw has some shape of an envelope, we call it positive envelope, and everybody knows about that. And we have here two, two areas, which is centric occlusion and centric relation. And look at this study by Pamiger, which shows out of 686 contacts, 588 were in centric occlusion, and 15 in centric relation. And the other study showed that uh, of 180 swallows, we have 162 tooth to contact in centric occlusion and five in centric relation. That means this position shouldn't be neglected, the centric relation. So it is jaw relationship. It might not by, uh, be like within the function, the normal function, but that could be utilized by some patients that this studies showed, and this studies actually is telemetric registration. So it shows there is an evidence that the use of this jaw relationship. So some people might be actually having, you know, some function between centric relation and centric occlusion. So there are some movements, for example. And when you do your occlusal examination, one of the important things which shouldn't be overlooked when you examine the occlusion is to examine the centric occlusion, which is the bite, the habitual bite, the maximum intercuspation, okay? And the centric relation. So you should be able to develop the skill to examine this in order to see the direction of the slide. The reason for that, because if your restorations will change this direction of the slide from centric relation to centric occlusion, or will interfere with this envelope, which I showed you here, okay? this might actually cause some bad effects on the restorations or on the masticatory system itself. So centric relation is a concept, of course, I can't cover it in this lecture, but you need to learn this skill. And we use it in restorative dentistry in different aspects. So let me give you some examples. First of all, in order to adopt the conformative approach, which I mentioned already, that we don't need to, we don't actually want to change this relationship between centric relation and centric occlusion. We don't want to change the slide, for example, okay, in order not that to affect the masticatory system. So we, do, we need to keep the envelope the, of movement as it is for patients when we do simple restorative dentistry. In order to do that, you need to be able to examine the centric relation, examine the slide between the centric relation and intercuspid position before you start your restorative work and recording it and making sure after you providing your restorations that this, this is, wasn't changed. This is the important part in uh, simple restorative dentistry, which we call it conformative approach. Now, when you plan to reorganize the occlusion, when you want to change the OVD, for example, we want to manage a case of tooth surface loss. We don't have now any more a reproducible position in uh, ICP, in intercuspid position. We don't have a reproducible bite. So we need another reference point, another reproducible, repeatable, reliable three R's position, which is the centric relation, because centric relation is still there because it's, it is jaw relationship. It's not teeth relationship. Teeth are worn down, teeth are gone. I still have another position which I can build up my restorations on, which is called 
centric elation and it is reproducible and it is original. I mean, in the patient's envelope, I didn't create any new position. And this is the same position we use when we do complete dentures, of course. When we try to make a stabilization splint to manage a patient uh, with myofascial pain or a patient with a bruxism, or we want to use a splint to test the increase of OVD in advanced restorative dentistry when we manage to surface loss, for example, I need again to make this splint in centric relation. So I need to learn how to get and register centric relation. And I highlighted the last one, which is the slide between RCP and ICP could be associated with some occlusive problems in some patients. So these occlusive problems I showed you, I'll come back to it. These occlusive problems shown in this slide actually could be a result of a deflective contact between RCP and ICP. You won't be, imagine that a problem at the back teeth, for example, causing a problem in anterior teeth, you know, and I'll show you how uh, in the next slides. And this concept of centric relation, by the way, of course, is well known in the field of occlusion. And Peter Dawson, who's one of the pioneers uh, in occlusion around the world, he said this, which I quoted, out of the factors of occlusion, centric relation is the single most important that must be understood by every dentist who works on teeth. And this guy spent his entire life career in occlusion, and he's the founder of uh, Dawson's Academy, of course, in the United States, a well-known uh, academy. And he published this book, which again talks in details about centric relation and the importance of knowing that and the importance of developing the technique of knowing them. So coming back to our main point, the slide between RCP, which is the retruded contact position in centric relation and between the ICP could be deflective. That means it actually causes an extensive movement of the jaw. And that might be the cause for wear, drifting, mobility, and a typical loss of bone support in the anterior teeth. For example, if you have a patient, when you probe it with the uh, perio probe, you find no perio evident in the other teeth, but there is a big bony pocket around one anterior tooth. You might say this is occlusive trauma, but this is a general term. If you want to know what type of occlusive trauma, of course, we need actually uh, to, to check that and checking the contact between RCP and ICP is one of the examination should be done here. And correcting it, it actually, most of the cases will reduce the trauma on the anterior tooth. So again, a problem in deflective contact from RCP to ICP causing a problem in the anterior teeth. So we need to check, check this slide. So we need to learn this technique, how to find, uh, you know, the centric elation and check the slide which could be the cause of some anterior teeth to uh, surface loss here uh, and see the slide between RCP and ICP. And assessing the occlusion, of course, needs of, it's a full package, guys. It's not only putting the patient, ch checking the ICP and RCP. You need to get the models articulated in semi-adjustable articulators using a face bow, of course, and we can actually demonstrate all of these movements on the articulator itself. And you know, learning this skill, this is acquired skill improves with practice. You need to practice that in order to master this centric relation. Okay. So uh, the way of the operators, how the operator is sitting uh, in the chair, I know the level of the, for example, the elbows and the patient's supine position and how the patient's neck extended slightly, chin pointed upwards. All of these factors are important to get uh, you know, the centric relation uh, found and registered correctly. And even the ways of putting the thumbs uh, and the fingers, we try to manipulate the jaw here. It's called by many one manipulation. We don't push the jaw, of course. You know, it's like a big topic, the centric relation, as I said. And I mean, there's not a scope of this lecture, but one of the elements you need to master if you want to really to control the occlusion and the, know the reasons for some uh, like uh, uh, failed restorations which are related to occlusion, you need to master the technique of finding centric relation and watching the slide from RCP to ICP, of course. Okay, I want you now, this is, uh, so the first thing, the first take home message to learn that you need to examine the occlusion, you need to examine the articulatory system, of course, in general, you, uh, you know, examining the TMJs, the uh, muscles of mastications and the occlusion, and within the occlusion examination, you need to be 
uh, really competent at finding centriculation and recording it. Now, I, I want to touch on other factors which might cause the problems of the anterior teeth. I want you using your fingertips. Yeah, I've got some now locations here. Just click on the photo, which you think it's like the correct shape of a crown in terms of morphology. So I have participants clicked on this shape. I have now participants clicking on this one here. Okay, let's see who's the winner for this one. Okay, so more clicks on the one on the left-hand side. Okay, few on the right-hand side only. Let's see. Keep on clicking, guys. Okay, more to the left-hand side. Yes, I think, yeah, this makes sense. Look at the palatal aspect of the anterior crown here, as opposed to the one here. So we need to consider the palatal aspect carefully when we prepare the crowns, guys, for anterior restorations, because we need to consider the movement of the mandible on this like palatal aspect in protrusion. And this shouldn't be like a slope or th thick one, thick palatal uh, surface or cingulum, because that will obstruct the protrusive movement as you can see here. So this the protrusive movement needs to be done smoothly in the correct shape of the uh, like palatal aspect of the anterior tooth. This actually uh, leads us to a concept called the freedom and centric, which is freedom and centric. It means that the teeth, when they occlude posteriorly, they should allow slight movement of the cusp tip inside the fossa rather than to be a wedge. So the posterior teeth, when they occlude, they need the cusp needs to have some room for it to move slightly forward. If you, you have the tip uh, here, the fossa is pointed and you have the palatal aspect is thick, this actually will allow no freedom in centric. And that means we have excessive forces applied on the anterior teeth. So two things you have to remember here. Anterior teeth shouldn't be a thick slope here, should be the correct morph morphology on the palatal aspect when you restore that. And posterior teeth, which are related to anterior teeth as well, should have a room in the fossa for the freedom and centric. So freedom and centric is related to both the posterior and the anterior in order to achieve it, okay? Which is called long centric sometimes uh, in other books. So again, this will not allow freedom and centric here, but this one will allow it. So you might do actually some anterior restorations, which they look marvelous. They look absolutely great in terms of the aesthetic, but the patient feels that them locked. Locked means they can't have any room of movement there. And with time, you can tell the consequences of that. So again, because of neglecting the palatal aspects of the anterior teeth to be reproduced in the correct morphology or a problem in restoring posterior teeth when you make the fossa like point, uh, point fossa. So again, it's not enough only to give some room here. You need to give the correct morphology. The technician can do any uh, crown for you here with a, a thin layer of porcelain of PFM, but with a wrong morphology. So something like, okay, you look after the labial aspects of the teeth, but how about the palatal aspects of the teeth? So if you don't get the correct forward movement, the correct, uh, occlusion here, you will end up with the failed anterior restorations because of the poor morphology of the anterior uh, palatal aspects. Okay, so and this is quite common. That could be related to lack of feral effect, of course, here, but again, feral effect, uh, the uh, results of the lack of feral effect is more of longitudinal fracture of the root rather than, you know, uh, decementing of the uh, post crown here. So remember, if you go back to our undergraduate knowledge about the preparation of the anterior teeth, you need it to be in two planes here, of course. And guess what? Don't be shy of, or you feel it, yeah, that you're above it, that you use the silicon index. Even with an expert, there is no harm with using this one, which will make a big difference on knowing you know, that you've got enough 
a preparation and the exact shape with the cingulum and the palatal aspect of the teeth, especially in important teeth like canines. We'll talk about canines as well, how, why it's very important to reproduce the palatal aspect uh, correctly. So using the correct bear while preparation, using silicon index will help a lot in getting this sorted. Okay, so if you want to get a, a good function, you need to get a good morphology in your preparation. And if you want to, uh, your, your technician to provide you with the good uh, restoration with the uh, excellent morphology, you need your preparation to be spot on in first place. So always measure the thickness of the temporary. The thickness of the temporary will give you an idea about your preparation and about, you know, uh, that you have enough room and the shape of it as well. Okay. Okay, so that's a, a good opportunity not to be missed here. Freedom and centric, how would you know that if you have a freedom and centric or not? If you have uh, your, your fingers are clean now while you're listening to my lecture, okay, guys, or sanitized, okay, you make sure that your hand are clean. You can put your finger on the labial aspect of the anterior, upper anterior and, or upper incisors and just tap, tap on your back teeth, okay? If you feel any sort of tremor, you know, a jerking movement there and the anterior teeth, that means you don't have a freedom and center. This is a simple one to test. This is like a not very objective, of course, this is subjective assessment for that, but it gives you an idea whether you have freedom and centric or not. Okay, I'm sure now people are testing their teeth and you can tell. Again, this is an example of how to create a freedom and centric by you know, or helping creating freedom centric by increasing the width of the fossa. This fossa will allow freedom and centric occlusion, but this one, the pointed one, will not allow it. In terms of implants, for example, this is very important, whether it's with our uh, implants, uh, sorry, anterior implants or posterior implants, you need to reduce the load on them. And, you know, it's always advisable when you have implant supported crown to have a big fossa here to allow some freedom and centric wider than usual. OK, so about two to three millimeters platform, you know, uh, with the opposing uh, teeth. So no freedom in, cent in centric is described actually as a, what we call it constricted chewing pattern or CCP. This restricted envelope of function, it might actually cause some problems or, you know, chipping of the anterior porcelain or, you know, crowns. Uh, which is again something that needs to be always uh, uh, in mind. So, a patient with the CCP might present with chipped wound anterior teeth and sometimes TMJ symptoms. You have to be careful about the relationship between uh, like the TMJ or TMD and occlusion. Uh, I wrote a, uh, like a review article about that published last year uh, in Journal of Primary Dental Care about this. And, you know, this is still not supported by evidence, you know, that, you know, any clues or problems might cause a, a TMD. So I have to be careful about that. But here we're talking about the restorations. So something like that, you know, these meant to be palatal aspects of the teeth. Of course, they should look like a label aspects of teeth. You can actually warn them two faces there. So um, again, especially in patients class two, DEV2, the skeletal pattern is important as well here. Bulky cingulums, all of these will cause this constricted chewing pattern. How would you examine it more precisely than tapping on your back teeth and putting the finger on the label aspect I just showed you? You can use the what you call the secret of success in occlusion, which is Shimestock foil. Okay, Shimestock foil. Uh, I'm going to talk about it in a minute uh, in a little bit of details and how uh, all the advantages of using it. Uh, so what we do, we can ask the patient to sit upright here and close the teeth together, putting the shim stuck foil held by Miller's forceps here, as you can see. And then uh, the, patient, the patient can actually, uh, uh, sorry, catch the, uh, the shim stuck between the teeth there. So we can't uh, pu uh, pull it through. And then we change the patient's uh, head position so tilt it backwards. And we'll see if the shim stuck is still held between the teeth, this patient has this constructed uh, chewing pattern or the, the no freedom and centric. Because even changing the position of the condyles didn't change the contact point here. So the patient have a very close contact between the anterior teeth in other terms. 
So Shimstock foil, you can, I'm, I'm sure many of my colleagues, they know it. It's eight micros foil. It has many advantages. So let me see how many of you using Shimstock foil, guys. If you can vote for that, do you use Shimstock foil? Yes or no? Okay, so getting some votes here, almost 50-50. Okay, so people who are voting here, we have the vast majority not using the shim stock foil. This is one of the take home messages guy from my uh, brief lecture today is to get that in your drawer for a crucial examination. It is very useful foil, has, it's versatile, has multiple use in dental practice. Let me show you uh, some of the use of that. It is actually a feeler gauge. This is the, the definition of the shim stock. So usually we use it in practice uh, to check whether the tissue restorations, they have occlusion or they are infracluded. You see what I mean? Because eight microns thickness there. It, it doesn't have ink, of course. It doesn't mark the teeth. So the important of that, you can actually check whether the articulation of models are correct or not. Because when you take impressions for study models and you pour them with the uh, stone and cast them and you put them in articulator and you put the bite registration material, sometimes there are potential errors there in the articulation. So you have an eight microns gauge. So if you put this eight microns between the patient's teeth, all right, and then record that, that for example, the upper six with the lower six, they hold the shim stock. The upper four, it doesn't hold the shim stock because there's a little bit of gap. This is the patient's occlusion. And you can ask the technician or yourself, if you have your articulated models in the articulator, to check by putting the shim stock between the stone, between the study models, okay? And then check whether it's the same clinically. That means your articulation is spot on. Okay, and vice versa. So if, for example, your clinical record showing that upper six with the lower six, they are catching the shim stock here, but on the lab, it's pulled through. That means there is a problem in the articulation, as simple as that. Okay, so you have an accuracy down to eight microns with that. The other advantage of using it, this is something, you know, in field of occlusion, guys, most of it, it's not evidence-based. Let, let, let's talk about the facts there. There are some suggestions from patient people, sorry, uh, uh, experience, okay. Uh, but we don't have like evidence-based studies to show it is a must to use this protocol, for example, or not. In most of the aspects of occlusion. But one of the things which is advisable, let's say, rather than a protocol, is to, when you do implants dentistry, you should have some sort of clearance of about 30 microns between the implant-supported uh, prosthesis or crown and again, the opposing teeth. In order to do that, how would you gauge these 30 microns? We have eight microns thickness of the shim stock. So if we fold it to four layers there, four layers should be gripped between the teeth there, but three layers should be pulled through. You see what I mean? That means there is a clearance by 30 microns. It doesn't need you know, extensive math skills to figure this out. So again, yes, we can use it to estimate how much clearance we want. Uh, one of the things introduced by this company, you know, uh, which will be very helpful because somebody might ask, how would I compare the clinical uh, findings of Shim Stockhold with the lab? You can get this sheet. I'm happy to post it for you. Um, it's available on the web, I'm sure. Um, and it's called Shim Stockhold. It's very simply, uh, simple sheet can be used easily. So you can actually put marks, for example, between 1-1 one, one and 4-1. Is the shim stock held between these teeth? Put yes or no. Again, between 1-6 and 4-6, we found it held, put yes. And then send this to the, uh, over to the technician. The technician will compare it with the cast and will make sure that the articulation was absolutely spot on and correct. Okay. So again, a sheet like this one, simple one, can facilitate the communication between you and the technician regarding the accuracy of articulation. So coming back to the management of the constricted chewing pattern uh, uh, which I showed you, um, we said that, okay, the patient doesn't have freedom in centric and you uh, provide the patient with some composite restorations, for example, anterior teeth. 
so if the patient has this strong bite anteriorly, so there is no freedom and centric, let's say, you need to do something about giving some sort of easing of this area. If we use thin articulating paper, you might actually remove uh, some of the clusal contacts and create a gap between the teeth. We don't want infracluded restorations, guys. This will cause over eruption and will cause disturbance of the occlusion of the patient. Unless we do something like dull concept, which is completely different there, you know, when you leave some gaps in posterior teeth, this is monitored, okay? But again, coming back to this one, so use 200 microns articulating papers and ask the patient to chew on that and get some marks there. These are marked by 200 microns. Easing this one until you don't have marks and use these thin articulated paper, which is 40, you should have some marks there. So this will create some room in the anterior teeth and reduce the load on them in case of the CCP, as we said, okay? So, uh, so this is something to, to avoid as a preventive measure to avoid problems in your anterior restorations in a patient with a CCP or lack of freedom in centric. Remember, Guys, other things which is very important, when you talk about anterior teeth, we have canines as well. When you involve your canines in the restorations, you have to be extremely careful about not disturbing the pre-existing occlusal scheme. If the patient has canine guidance, for example, I don't want to create an interference. I need to keep this guidance, okay? If the patient has group function, I need to keep this group function. I'm talking about simple restorative dentistry to conformative approach. So that's why I like, and you know, extensive care should be put there to reproduce the palatal aspects of the canines. You remember the palatal aspects of the canines, they're not bulky, they're not like a slope that we have a ridge, we have two fossa or slopes there. So this is actually there for a purpose because the canine guidance could be on expense of one of these slopes. If you make it bulky, if we make it like a, a, a belly shape there, that will obstruct the movement of the jaw and will actually lock the teeth in the lateral extensions. And we see a lot of problems with, the, unfortunately, full mouth, uh, you know, uh, porcelain, uh, full mouth rehabilitation with porcelain crowns or veneers, whatever, and the patient, okay, was over the moon after receiving this because it's marvelous aesthetics, but uh, as simple as that, they can't move the jaw, it's locked. The, those patients who have remunerary chewing pattern, they will not be able to do that. They will not to be able to actually slide the, the jaw right or left because you actually obstructed it with the poor morphology of the canine, something like that, bulky palatal surface. Okay, so again, this won't help. This is not the palatal aspect of the canine, something like that reasonably, okay? So look after that. The poor morphology will end up with poor guidance. So the patient will not be able to make uh, like a letter extensions with the good guidance. So most of these restorations will be replaced not only for the aesthetic reason because they're not good, but sometimes they're aesthetically acceptable as I said, but functionally they're not. So you have to look after uh, this area when you do the palatal preparation of the canine, of course. So good prep, good morphology of restoration, better knowledge of tooth morphology can help to optimize that. So that case actually uh, needed to be redone with a uh, you know, uh, new wax up. The wax up using some adjustable articulator should of course uh, achieve this lateral movement with the canine guide as a groove function. And by looking after the shapes of the upper and lower canines, either palatal aspects or the labial aspects of the lower canines here, to achieve this disclusion in the lateral exertions. Whether you use a digital system or using you know, traditional way is the same thing. The same principles have to be applied in looking after the morphology of the uh, anterior teeth and especially the canines. This is a case published in BDJ a long time ago, which showed the patient couldn't tolerate this bridge. And the problem was the bulky uh, palatal uh, surface of the canine. The first thing you do here, guys, before replacing the existing bridge with a brand new one, get the temporary. And on the temporary, try to achieve some guidance here on the teeth. Once the patient is happy with that, and most of the cases patients would be absolutely satisfied by having a guidance there, you can actually copy that in your final restorations. 
Okay. The other thing is the to consider the protrusive movements as well. The protrusive movements when you have like a, a class four restoration or you have a veneer, make sure if you have guidance on adjacent teeth on a sound tooth in protrusive movement, you don't need contact and protrusive movement of the restoration as long as there is a sound tooth which can actually ensure the guidance there. So if this tooth can ensure a protrusive guidance, you don't need a contact on uh, your restoration. So that will save you troubles, possible troubles of that. Especially if you have thin veneers, you need to avoid the guidance on them. And when you have veneers like that, try to get the closer contacts mainly, not on interface, of course, between the restoration and the tooth. Try to get the closer contact in the sound tooth and the guidance, if you can avoid it, if there is like adjacent tooth, which is natural, make it on expense of that tooth. <clears throat> the last point I want to mention here, guys, about, you know, uh, we're talking about the importance of the palatal aspects of the anterior teeth, okay, uh, in terms of the guidance, the protrusive movements. So when you prepare the teeth, if you prepare multiple anterior teeth, eventually you're going to end up with uh, losing the shape or the morphology of the palatal aspects because you prepare them. So you send the, te the technician the impression and uh, you know, they've got the cast and everything and try to wax up these uh, restorations. So they wax them up, okay, could be like a nice wax up post in the palatal aspects, but it is not the same morphology exactly like the one before preparation. I think you got the point, okay? So we're losing here a, a guide. So if you prepare the teeth, I don't have an adjacent tooth which shows me the shape of the palatal teeth for this specific patient, you know, that might differ between patients. So what would you do? It's advisable in these cases is what you do is the technique one is to do what you call the crown about method. This is a modified this photo just to explain what I want to say. It's crown about method that you do every other tooth. So prepare one tooth, leave one. Don't do them at one go. Okay, this will cost you and the patient an extra visit, but that will help the technician in waxing up the palatal aspect of this tooth by looking at the adjacent tooth still there. You see what I mean? And then when the, you, you fit the crown here, you can get, um, you know, uh, the, the, the technician can get the morphology from the crown, which is already in a place. Somebody might say, oh, how about the shade? The shade, of course, you selecting the shade carefully and the, the, the technicians using the same system. There is no here any sort of concerns about, you know, uh, making another visit and, you know, copying the same shade. That's not a problem at all. But you need here two impressions, of course, and you need, you know, uh, more than one visit. But that will ensure the, post the palatal aspects is being reproduced exactly like the teeth before preparation. So we can actually, uh, as I said, so I just move this one. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me just move this one, sorry. Yes, so now the other technique, so that one, when you have teeth, you need to prepare. The other technique, when you have two surface locks, locks like this one, so you don't have originally any sort of morphology of the teeth, and you need to crown these teeth, of the posterior, for example, the definitive, uh, you know, including the posterior teeth, if the definitive treatment is like crowns on the anterior teeth, get the temporary right. So once you get the temporary right, what you do, make sure that the patient, of course, using the accurate impression, the face bow and you articulated them and the uh, semi-adjustable articulator has done the wax up <clears throat> and you're fabricating the temporary. So this, these are the stages. Make sure when you do the temporary, okay, that you get the occlusion in static and dynamic occlusion, right, in terms of the guidance. So we'll spend some time, uh, you know, adjusting the palatal aspects of the temporary until you get the guidance, of course, between posterior and anterior teeth. And then you now satisfied, uh, of course, I just mentioned that, that the, the temporary restorations here, although we tell them temporary, we call them temporary, it's more than temporary, they are provisionals. The, the reason for that, because it's not only a cap to, uh, you know, cover the tooth, it's actually testing the tolerance of the, these restorations and the OVD and the occlusal scheme, which we produce. So it's more than a temporary. I like this article by uh, Professor Trevor Berg, uh, long time ago, it's 2005, which is saying that the provisions is not just a temporary. 
talking about the provisional crowns. So get the, yourself a good material of the provisional crowns in order to test it, test your clues scheme as well. So once you get that, now the temporary is ready and it's actually done according to a good occlusion because you spend time testing the static occlusion, the lateral exertions, you adjusted them until you got the canine guidance or group function sorted. Now I'm going to do the definitive restoration. So how would I copy the palatal aspects of the temporary, which is already in good occlusion in my definitive restorations? Okay, so first of all, we need to check that there's no fracture, everything. If there is any fracture or mobility or sensitivity or cement failure or discomfort or drifting, that means the patient's not tolerating, of course, the occlusive scheme or the increase of OVD if there is an increase of OVD. So that's, of course, uh, it is, uh, you know, sorted already. Now I want to copy the palatal aspects of that, which are in a good occlusion. In restorative dentistry, there is, uh, after, you know, for example, you've got the occlusion right here, you've got canine guidance, there's no canine here, so the medial aspect of the premolar took the guidance, so it's a perfect palatal aspect, I want to copy it in my definitive restorations. So we take the impressions, we take a face pull, of course, and we request what it's let me show you that, or what's called copying anterior guidance. Copying the anterior guidance is a well-known um, procedure in restorative dentistry to actually copy the shape of the palatal aspects of the, especially of the temporaries in the lab. So how would you do that? You get a little bit of a duralay, you know the duralay, if everybody knows the duralay, which is uh, self-cured acrylic material basically. And it's uh, the advantages of using it gives you good working time. You get it like a dough, right? So on the semi-adjustable articulator, that's in the lab. So you have here, pay attention to this guys. This is an impression and this a cast of the temporaries if the pro of the provisionals. So we took an impression of the temporaries or the provisionals and we have a cast here, we articulated them. The dough here is soft. So what we do in articulator, we try to move the articulator forward. We move it to the lateral side, uh, sorry, right-hand side, left-hand side, yeah, lateral exertions. We do all the dynamic movements. This, the incisal pin here and the articulator now is going to create a shape inside the dough itself, inside the duralay. And this shape is based on how the lower moving on the upper is the opposite in the articulator, of course, based on the shape of the temporary from inside, you know, because, you know, this will create a shape which is, which looks like the palatal aspects of the temporary because the movement is done by the temporaries here. So have something like that on the table itself. So what we do do now, look at that. This is the, again, a close up. This is the temporary. Okay, this is the provisionals and the moving. Now with them on the articulator, we created a shape here. So let's do uh, show that show that in this illustration. So these are the temporaries moving. Look at that. The shape created here looks like the shape of the palatal aspects here because that's exactly how the jaw is moving uh, on this particular patient. Now we have uh, we remove the temporaries from the articulator. We get the, the prepared teeth, and the prepared teeth now it's gonna be waxed up. The wax up should, the wax should actually make the same movement here. And the guide for us is this template here. So say for example, we wax it up this way, right? And we try to move, the jaw is not moving. We, we carve it, remove it from it until this movement happening here. So this shape here of the template will guide us to the shape of the palatal aspect. So by doing that, we cup it the palatal aspects of the temporaries, which were done in a patient's mouth with a good occlusion. Maybe it's difficult to explain it to sometimes, you know, in slides when I show you a, a video, we can do that in our teaching in the college, we show videos and we demonstrate that in the lab as well. But let me show you that, you know, that the pin can move from this side to the side. This, this actually was soft, so created a shape here. The same one we use it when we create the final uh, restoration. So you can see here, after waxing up, you can see that the shape is created here and there is a smooth movement inside it. That means the, the palatal aspects of the anterior teeth is the same like the professionals. 
I think uh, uh, we can stop here, but before that, uh, all most of the procedures, we uh, put them together in a book, uh, which is uh, published already now. The hard copy is going to be on shelves in November. You, you can actually order you the uh, pre-order uh, already now of a book called Practical Procedures in Dental Occlusion, uh, where my good friend Riaz Yar, my, myself, in the quarantine, actually, we had a good chance to do some Zoom meetings actually to finalize this book, which is a book targeting general dental practitioners for uh, in, in the subject of occlusion, and it's mainly practical procedures. So we try not to uh, like uh, touch in details in the theory, uh, but to make it like uh, practical. And there is like a link for videos in a website. When you purchase the book, you can access to see all the practical procedures in the videos. So uh, thank you very much for your listening and I am happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you, Ziad. If anybody has any questions, can they pop it in the chat window and then Ziad can have a read and answer them for you. Okay. Okay, so thank you. I can't see any more questions. Okay. So far, there is no questions. Okay. okay, I think got some thank yous coming in. So uh, thank yeah. you very much, Professor Ziad. I don't think we've got any questions from you. Um, but if anybody doesn't have any questions, they can contact uh, the Knightsbridge Dental Care and send it to the email address info at kbac.uk. So Knightsbridge Academy. Yes, I'm happy to see that, you know, the reason for silence is a clear presentation. Exactly Absolutely. <laughs> everybody obviously understood thank everything. And you've. thank you very much. Um, can, so thank you, Ziad. You can sign off now. 